many magicians how are you so welcome to a very spontaneous live class let me see if i'm actually clear on this class okay so i'm doing this as episode 14 of the money magic series actually uh, usually we'd have an interview that goes out on fridays we didn't, <laughs> not because there was no guest, there was actually a guest, but we just struggled to record the entire show. Sorry, I have to show more of me, right? So we just struggled to record the entire show um, for three days. We tried for three days. So we're both like, okay, we'll do this in a few more months because there's resistance and it's all good. So I decided actually this is a good time to take this part of episode 14 for me to unpack some of the things that we've been talking a lot about that the other students that have been talking about the course came up and spoke about. Hi, Donna. Donna, it must be like 5 a.m. in New York or something. So I don't like, wow, that's so nice to see you on here. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, just unpacking this whole thing of what good enough and vow in, of invisibility, vows of invisibility look like. And then I just decided, let me actually share a story with you guys that I also shared with the Money Magic students yesterday, right? So you guys remember Jane, right? Um, so if you don't remember Jane, let me do a quick snippet. I've written many articles on Jane go on the face on the wealthy money facebook page in this group just search jane and you'll see her journey like i started writing about her in 2019 the money magic students met her in 2018 when they came for retreats at my house in the village so a lot of people know Jane, like people go to the village and meet up with her even when I am not there. Actually, people are meeting up with her tomorrow. They're going to be sleeping over at my mom's house tomorrow to see Jane, which is why I'm sharing the story, right? Because I, I was like, wow, Val, like this idea of remaining invisible and not showing ourselves is so multi-layered. And when we come from collective cultures, especially um, certain families, certain black families in South Africa, for me, my mom's side of the family, right? There's a lot around visibility. So let me unpack how it looks like. So yesterday I tell my mom, you know, the business, uh, the chili, oh, who is Jane? Let's start there. So Jane is a woman that came um, when I started the retreats in 2018. She came, oh, Sorry, guys, that is not the ice cream truck. That is the bread, man. We get freshly made bread delivered every morning and evening in Sri Lanka. So that's what you're hearing. Hi, Wipilo. So, yeah, so Jane came to me in 2018 and um, I was starting the retreats. I was looking for someone to help me with the retreats. Her uncle is my mom's client. Uh, my mom is a herbalist and a kick-ass healer, actually. She works from the very deep wounded healer archetype. So on my mom's side of the family, like my great grandfather was one of the most well-known Sangomas from that time. So like we all come with different gifts that come from this bloodline, you know, so that's where Honey and I get our gifts. So my mom is incredible with, um, with herbs and she's really great with like helping women have babies when doctors have told them no and she's a retired nurse as well so her thing was when she was in hospital when she was working as a nurse in hospital she would go whisper to her patients to come see her after hours because the chemical stuff I don't I shouldn't even be doing this right because it's true but she was like the chemical stuff was killing them and there was a better way for them to get healing through plants and she would be able to mix things for them and so this is how she's known in the village so she became known in the village because while well, she was a nurse, right, and people would know her from the hospital, but then people start to talk to say, this woman helped me with ABCD. So, um, and then she also worked on Jane for like womb stuff and really healed her. 
Uh, actually, not just womb stuff. I don't want to say this willy nilly because it's crazy. But Jane shared the story with the students at the retreat where the doctors had said that she would have to, um, that there was, uh, that they suspected cancer. And my mom was like, nonsense. She has very crazy theories about various diseases. So I'm not here to share those theories. But then she was like, I know, uh, don't go to chemo, don't do anything. I'll help you heal this with plants. And she did. And then when Jane went back to the doctors, they said that there was a misdiagnosis because there was absolutely nothing wrong with her, with her womb, right? So I don't really share that story much. That is Jane's story and it is really not mine to share, right? And like, it's also my mom's story. And like, my mom is a trip on most days, right? So yeah, the whole uh, plant healing. So anyway, Jane came to visit my mom and she came to pay uh, some money to her from her uncle. And then I was there and my mom was like, why don't you use Jane for your retreats? Why can't she be your assistant and your helper? Because you're looking for an assistant and helper. I was like, perfect you know so jane is gorgeous she's 25 she's incredible i was like yeah uh let's go and then <laughs> so said to you say hi hi said to so then um i can she came over uh and she started working with me and she started and then the students loved her so much they would tip her you know so i was like you guys need to tip jane over and above what i pay her and jane had been praying to make a hundred rand in december 2018 just to buy her baby shoes you know not a baby because her daughter's about eight but so cute you guys literally such an incredible little human you know? and so she's so she was praying for that and when I heard the story I was like no freaking way so I I was like to the students we're gonna donate you guys have to tip Jane everything and so she made um, within like a space of 10 days I think she made about uh, 2,500 from working the retreat so obviously she was very happy but then she started to see the, she started hearing the students and I was having them set crazy income goals, right? And they were just like going crazy, asking questions, all sorts of things. And Jane was like, how do people make this kind of money? You know, like I, like I don't have a degree, but I just want a job. Is it possible that you can help me get a job that will pay me minimum wage, at least 3,500 or 4,000 a month, um, which if in US dollars you convert by that, let's just divide by 15, right? So we're talking about 250 to $300. And I was like, no way in how, you know, uh, nothing wrong with earning that much every month. Right. But my say what I said to Jane was people don't work with me for that. Like, I believe that if people are sent to me, they sent to me for like insane shit, you know, that you have a goal and that's what you have a goal that you want to manifest that is big and you're scared about it. So this is why we somehow cross paths. So she was like, okay. <laughs> so I was like, what if I teach you, uh, what do you like to do? So she was like, I actually love watching you cook and the dishes that you make. It's my favorite thing. I, and then she confessed that she's been, she'd been going home after the first retreat. She bought the same ingredients I bought. She'd written down the spices I'd used. And then she was starting to make the same dishes at home, which is kind of crazy because I'm vegan. And she was like, she she just got sold on the dishes and everything. And she was like, yeah, let me try this. So I said, what if I teach you my special chili recipe? It will be just our little secret. You have the chili recipe, then you start selling it, right? Long and short story, anyway, Jane was able to start making about 5,000 a month, which is about $400 a month by mid 2019. And then by um, the end of 2019, she had now added uh, French fries and had added other streams of income, had grown the chili business into other villages. It, yeah, it got a little crazy and local shops were stocking from her. So in a space of 12 months, she literally grew a business. So it was incredible. So I've been sharing these stories all over social media, a lot of people. So some of you that are watching here have 
contacted Jane, you guys talked to her on WhatsApp, you've built your own relationship with her, you know, so people started offering to help her in different ways because they were just so inspired. So it just became this whole thing. And she was just, she's just so open. So she accepted that. Then um, I introduced her to one of my clients this year when COVID started. And one of my clients is connected to a chef and has a chef business. So I was like, you guys really need chili in this business. And she was like, okay. You know? And so then she connected and then they um, connected with Jane and long story short, they are now ordering like 20 liters a week of, of chili from Jane that goes from the village to uh, Johannesburg and Jane still has um, still does all the other villages and supplies people. Uh, a few weeks, uh, about two months ago, someone in Nalspreit contacted me here on Facebook. So then she started having to communicate with people in Nalspreit and getting chili delivered there. So it's growing, right? But I also coach Jane on the side. So there's a lot of things that we're doing with her mindset, with practical stuff, with this is what we need to do, all, all sorts of things, you know? So then I tell my mom that, okay, the chili business beyond the 20 liters that's going to Johannesburg, there's a big thing. And I can't talk about this big thing planned, right? Uh, publicly, anyway, I shared it in the student group, but you know, that's a safe and small container. There's not many people on there. The, everything that happens there stays there. So anyway, big, big things are happening that could potentially mean millions for Jane right in the next in the next 12 months so then I'm like okay people need to come through and meet Jane for these business dealings they can't just go on my word and go on whatsapp and read what she says or just talk to her on the phone now it's bigger things at play so they need to come to the village and they need to sleep over at our house so that they can spend a few days with Jane observing her getting to know her talking about the vision that is coming up, etc. Okay, everything's cool. Shared this with my mom two weeks ago. And then she was like, they can't come through um, yet because I'm in Johannesburg. They need to come when I'm at home. Makes sense, you know, normal, naturally. So then she's back home now. And so I was like, okay, now they're ready to come. Can you host them? My mom's like, yeah, I can definitely host them. Not a problem. But then now my mom knows the scale of the business and how it's going to grow. So then she says to me, wait, you want to tell me, um, I don't know if you guys hear the rain, but <laughs> it's monsoon time here. So it rains all the time now, not even joking, all the time. And of course, it's always hot. So anyway, um, my mom says, is there anyone in the family, in both sides of your family, on my fa in my family, her family, right? And on my dad's family, you want to tell me that in these two families and the extended families, you could not find someone that you could give this chili recipe to and that you could have helped grow this chili business. I I'm just like, whoa, what just happened? So then my mom goes on to explain to say, well, actually, it's your brains that are that develop the recipe and you're helping this business grow. So I feel like actually it, and that's coming from ancestral stuff. You don't just wake up and be this person. So there must be something within either bloodline that you've inherited that has given you the cooking gene, which I know is from my great grandmother on her side. right? <laughs> But anyway, I say nothing. And so she insists that money and business concepts with her growing up, um, how they were taught, and I know this, right? How they were taught is that you are always loyal to the family. So Olga, you say, wow, rain, rain, rain. I can hear it. Yeah, it is crazy. It's raining cats and dogs out here. I'm out on the porch and just watching it rain. <laughs> so like that's the perks of being in Sri Lanka with the rain. It's like you can just sit out on the porch or in the hammock and just watch it rain. So yeah, so then she's saying that while everyone um, in the way that they were brought up is like, if there's an opportunity, you plug family first, right? So for everything, you plug family because you can't trust people, right? 
So then I understand this. So then I take a few after then I talk to my mom and I tell her, okay, I have given this, this idea and this business to my cousins on my dad's side, actually, you know, but people have their own journeys. Like my cousins have their own businesses. They have their own things that they're pushing. They have careers. So Jane is the only person in a position to do this full time. Like Jane doesn't have a side hustle. The reason why she is grown this business so fast is because she has focus for it right because she is fo this is what she does full time all the time it's like me and wealthy money right even though i'm in the, um i'm doing a bunch of other things they're not my main bread and butter you know like most of my attention comes in this company so my focus like focus will lead to growth right what we focus on will naturally grow right so Olga, you're saying um, you share with the with the person you were destined to, right? Yeah, so something like that. It's that, well, if we're family, then I kind of, then I basically take my skills and my, my thing is to grow you. But I'm like, but I've tried this and it hasn't worked with family. And now there's this great thing that is happening that could benefit everyone involved you know like my client the chef jane even myself other people that we will hire so there is so much opportunity now for so many other people and jane is the person that's literally doing this you know because she's creating the product she's making sure that the chili gets delivered to Joburg. she's doing that work right she's trying she's figuring out logistics she's doing all that but then so my mom's still not a happy right so after the call i I was like, okay, I can see I'm not getting anywhere. I'm trying to explain this, trying to explain the logic. And she's just like, she just doesn't see it. Because, and then she says to me how she was brought up and is literally, you always put your family first above all else, even in business. But then after I dropped the phone, I thought about it and I said, but wow, this makes all the sense in the world. And I promise you this then ties to vows of invisibility, right? Growing up, I was taught all the time that if people see your genius, see your epic nature, see who you are and what you're capable of, they will bewitch you and possibly take away that gift and end up killing you. <gasps> I mean, the trauma and the fear. So how I saw that play out with my mom, my aunts and my uncles was that every time my mom and my uncle were the ones that came up with brilliant entrepreneurial ideas, but they would never involve outsiders, right? So even when a skill was necessary and they didn't have a skill, to help grow the business, they would rather take family members and a lot of things would die, you know? So um, Malebo, you say, um, I don't, I know, hey, I was told that too. Yes, Malebo, so it's like, my goodness, I was told the same thing. So uh, growing up, it was that. So I literally saw my mom and my uncle come up with insanely brilliant brilliant ideas you know and my uncle would even get funding for some of the ideas certain things but they just couldn't push the ideas because everyone in the family had to get involved because outsiders were not trustworthy because outsiders would come with their crazy way of thinking and come with their witchcraft natures or come with their medicines and somehow that entire gift would be stolen from you or suddenly you won't be able to progress etc and now that i do the work that i do i suspect that sometimes what we and our families thought was actual witchcraft of the highest degree was actually our deepest traumas causing us to contract so as we expand with every expansion comes a whole host of new traumas and those traumas can literally set us back or completely destroy what we've built or destroy us 
I feel like this would have happened to me. I just happened to work with some incredible coaches and I have the Money Magic course. I have the Money Magic student group. I'm always in the group. I mean, the students know this, like something amazing will happen and I'll be back. Like I'll share it, celebrate with the larger Facebook community. And then two days later, I'll be like, and now <laughs> there's a whole new drama, you know, that I now need to work through, right? So uh, the thing is that, our parents and our grandparents and great grandparents often didn't have access to trauma work and they also didn't uh, they uh, probably didn't even understand what was going on at a deeper trauma level right so then this became part of like yeah for sure every time you expand of course people be with you so don't get involved with people but here's the problem when it came to my mom and my uncle they're brilliant business ideas certain often needed people with very specialized skills or different skill sets. And most times, my uh, the people in my family were not interested in those business ideas. They were not interested in pushing them. They really didn't want to do that. They had other interests, but now they were being guilt-tripped, shouted at, and woo, the shouting, hey? There were so many shoutings, like, you guys are not serious. You don't understand things. We could be so far as a family, but you guys don't want to hold, uh, help others. Like, I'm now trying to translate Masi Bambisane, like, completely, and Funuk Bambisana, like, you know, I'm trying to translate it from Zulu to English. So that's why I'm like, you don't want to hold it together, but you don't want to work together to make things happen, right? But the, truth, but the truth is that some people were just not interested, for one. I'm like, looking back, I'm like, it wasn't that people in the family were lazy, right? Um, even I was roped in once by my uncle to say, well, now you've got your degree, you've got your MBA, come home and let's work on this business concept. And then I was like, no. And he couldn't understand why I would say no when I saw the vision and I, un I understood it. But I also saw the crazy dysfunction, right? So I was like, no. So because everybody got roped in, you guys. And some people were just not there for the passion. Some people didn't want to be there. So then you're paying people that don't want to be there they're not passionate they haven't bought into the vision but it's family you trust them so you must grow together with them and without a shadow of a doubt all the businesses failed all the ideas would fall apart you know why because like the energies and everybody involved weren't it wasn't a right right and the second thing quite simply is that some people just didn't have the skills but now they were being forced to do that and it wasn't even their passion so they couldn't be bothered to go find the uh, to go hone those skills and so what this was for my family was this deep vow of loyalty to the family that i will not grow without my family right so if I grow, my family has to grow at the same pace as me. But like literally, I always say to the students, they know honey, they know me. Honey and I both do our own separate things. I cannot have my sister grow at the same pace as me and she cannot have me grow at the same pace as her. We have different interests, we're different people, all that. And also, how do you force another person onto a growth path? And how do you choose a journey for another soul, you know? So my mom was saying, well, now that this is definitely moving momentum, then plug your cousins in. Hi, Bo. But my cousins don't even know how this business runs. They don't know the thinking behind it. Like, now I need to go unseat people who are busy with their own, with their own lives and, cut and get them here. So the vow of invisibility is tied in sometimes to deep vows of loyalty to the family that if I am visible, uh, then my family must also be visible with me because it is not safe to be visible and alone on an individual level. I have to have my tribe with me. The world is unsafe, right? So that's the first thing, right? The vow of loyalty, which, whew, guys, I kid you not, I keep triggering my mom with this vow of loyalty and this vow of invisibility because for her, for me to be constantly out here teaching, sharing the knowledge that I have, it's like, <gasps> Now people know 
people know what you do. They know that you have this gift. Which means, oh my gosh, they're going to be with you. They're going to be with you. So she doesn't sleep easy, right? Meanwhile, I'm out here like unbothered. The person that she's bothering about and worrying about is unbothered and was like, yeah, whatever. Continue, keep living your life, you know? But it's a thing for her. And these deep beliefs, it's like at the core of it, it's not safe to be seen. Because if I am seen, then people will do bad things to me. It's not necessarily witchcraft. It could be like, they may steal from me, they may harm me in some way. So I need to hide myself. Here's the challenge though, that we keep talking about in the Property Magicians podcast with Mizo and that you hear all our guests talking about. For growth to happen, you need to be visible to people, right? You don't have to be hyper visible, but if you are selling a product and a service, how are people going to buy from you if they don't even know about your product? They don't know about the service. They don't know about you because you are the best kept secret because you're trying to protect yourself and keep yourself safe from harm from people. And also, do we even like... Here's my big thing, and this is where my mom always says, hmm, like, really, she doesn't know where she went wrong with me, because I always say to her, I feel like so many people are so self-absorbed, they're like literally 98% of the human race, myself included, we are so focused on our own drama, they're like, literally, I'll see someone's progress today, and then like, go back to making life about me, you know, so I'll quickly start to forget about other people so it's like it's not that I really believe that most people go they see our successes and then they go back and make things about them go into their own world their own drama perfect and then if they really resonate with the product and a service they all about it they buy it then they use it but I don't like I feel like most people are genuinely just focused on themselves right and not to say there isn't dark energies because they are and people do meddle in that but I do believe that the majority of humans are really about themselves and would be rather focused on on doing things that benefit them instead of trying to hold up another human being. Yeah, do they feel envious? Yeah, do they feel jealous? Yeah, do they try to self-sabotage you with talking ill and gossiping? Yes, but do they spend 100% of their time and their money and getting knowledge to try and harm you? Mm, I think that would take a lot of energy and time, right? <laughs> so anyway, I mean, like many people differ with me on this and we are allowed to differ, but that's not what this is about, right? So let's talk about this whole concept. So often of a vows of loyalty to the family and how most of us have been brought up with this. If you succeed, if you know there's an opportunity, you now need to plug in a family member. But now you are, because those are the only people that you can trust, right? Or you can't, you can't grow. Like my mom was saying, even over and beyond everything, why must money go outside the family? It's like, uh, it's not like I'm actively saying money must go outside the family. I'm saying, let us build something that can last for generations. And yeah, eventually the thing may grow so big that I can plug in different family members in the midst of this, right? That one day they can be plugged in if they get an interest. But right now they're not interested. But then we, and then sometimes we do the same with our friends, right? So then we shrink ourselves and we play small and we wait on our friends. We wait on our family. We wait on um, our significant others to catch up and be um, and basically grow at the same rate as us. So then we make, we invisibilize ourselves. So here's the thing, the vow of invisibility isn't that I am just, it's not about stage fright or I'm so scared to speak in front of a thousand people, although it is a little about that, right? What is it also about? It's about showing your true self. And for most people, the true self isn't, the true self that they are hiding isn't the negative, awful stuff, right? Yeah, sometimes it is, it's our shadows. For most of us, we work so hard to hide our light and our brilliance. So that is the thing that we spend so much energy and time and 
all sorts of things hiding. So our friend can't do this and we pretend that we also have the same issue. We know that we can do this job at work with our eyes closed, but because there's countless meetings and everybody's struggling, now we also make it a week, month long exercise to do something that would take us an hour. Right. Because now we don't want to show we don't want to show our brilliance. I know that I've got the capacity to help someone do A, B, C, D, but then I hide myself. Right. Or like as my mom was suggesting, even though she doesn't realize that's what she was suggesting. Right. Is that or this I have this business idea that could flourish in a space of months without any holding back, etc. But I now need to hold up for everybody else to catch up to me, right? Because, oh my gosh, it's not safe. And often our vows of invisibility are born directly from our family stories of loyalty. And it's not just with family. It's also our vows of loyalty to our friends. Part of why we keep ourselves invisible is because we want to keep getting the love of our family. We want to keep remaining the loyal daughter, the loyal cousin, the loyal family member. But at the same time, we are invisibilizing ourselves. And that is how we start to slow down income growth, right? Because if I'm constantly waiting for other people that are probably not even interested in the journey that I am forcing them onto, right? Then what is happening is that I'm not allowing myself to grow. And because I'm not allowing myself to grow, my income income is also stagnating. So I don't allow myself to take up opportunities, right? So Mizo in her um, uh, Money Magic series episode, um, was it 13 or 12? I can't remember. Don't even know if this is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's episode 12. We, she and I spoke about how so many women, especially black women that we asked to come on the podcast will say no, right? And a lot of that is coming from like, they don't feel like they are enough to be visible. So there is also this deep fear of not being like that. I don't want to be visible and I don't want to be seen. But then she and I know, and a lot of uh, black men and say yes to the podcast. Almost every black man that we ask to do the podcast says yes. Like I can count on my one hand, probably four or so that have said, eh, no, I'm not feeling it. And then after the first podcast that they do, they send us messages often and they say, can I please come back for another? This has been amazing for my business. So by stepping forth and being visible, they were able to grow their businesses. But then the first thing that we then often think because we're dealing with our vows of loyalty and often we're dealing with the deep story of we have not done enough and we are not good enough. What we then do, the first thing when we are given opportunities for visibility is we think, what will my family say? Oh my gosh, now I have to plug them in. They're going to ask for these things, etc., etc. Because we haven't learned how to put in boundaries in place with family, right? So it comes back to family and we haven't learned how to do that, how to put in boundaries in place with friends because of our deep vows of loyalty. And then they, they tie us up up into this a vow of invisibility so that we keep invisibilizing ourselves because while well, we don't know how to be because to us because when we have deep vows of loyalty it feels like choosing ourselves is being disloyal to the family or to our friends so it feels like a betrayal so we would rather betray ourselves and betray our own light in order to keep um, the relationships going because our vows of loyalty tie us up. And let me just say, like, the first thing I want to say, I understand fully. Like, the reason why I'm not even angry with my mom is that the vow of loyalty isn't something that you can just wake up and say, okay, I break this vow. Doesn't work like that, right? Vows are something in the Akashic plane and they are just layers to breaking them, right? So there's that's why we do Akashic records. That's why we do the healing work that we do in the Money Magic course, just to break these vows, right? So I didn't also, I, I had the same vows, by the way. So don't see me just being like this and being like, ooh, I don't have those vows now. I worked super freaking hard. <laughs> not in the normal work, but like I did a lot of the inner work to just break the vows. There were a lot of tears 
years. There were a lot of like going into Akashic Records. There were a lot of working with my inner child, my inner teen, helping them break these vows. And then, so that's why when my mom is like, oh, family, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, cool, whatever. Untriggered, unbothered, you know? And I'll even have conversations. I have these conversations with my cousins to be like, okay, um, this is not going to work, but let's see if we can do something else together. This is just not a thing that I can see myself doing business on with you guys, you know? So it's just, um, so the vows of loyalty, this is how like this, because we want to be loyal to our families and because we are being tied, not just in this plane, but on a spiritual plane and our souls have made these vows and are holding themselves to these vows. So it becomes difficult to just be like, oh yeah, whatever, not going to bother with them. It's their fault. It's their drama. It's their lives, whatever. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to try and do me. So we, it's easier for the, for us to then just invisibilize ourselves instead and choose um, to make ourselves visible, which then stagnate, uh, invisible, which then stagnates our income growth, right? Because as my, um, as one of my, two of my lecturers said some really profound things. So one of my lecturers in marketing uh, used to say when I was in business school for the MBA program, she used to say, there are three reasons why people don't buy from you. And they are all marketing reasons. And, but I now call them visibility issues, right? The first one is they can't find you. The first one is they don't know about you. And the third one is that they don't resonate with what you are selling and promoting. So you are visible to the wrong people because everything like literally, I believe that people resonate with just like different people resonate with different things. So like someone can come and sell me a golf club. I look at golf and I'm like, please move away. Like, I don't want to know anything about it, right? Then I have a cousin who is a professional, I mean, like tournament golfer, professional golfer. Obviously, if you go to her and you talk golf to her, she is all ears, right? So it's like completely different target audience. So that's also a visibility issue. So most of, so a lot of things are visibility issues. And so once we start to heal our visibility issues, we start to change, we start to, uh, we can start to grow our income. And sometimes even the target audience that you're talking to, most of us, again, it's like the family thing, like I'm safer doing business with my family, but really it would be better if I did business with strangers who are really kick ass at what I do because they are absolutely incredible. So that is also a visibility issue, right? And then another lecturer of mine, my entrepreneurship lecturer always said, sorry, if you guys see me moving my hands, it's mosquito time. I live in a tropical climate, so I'm just waving them away. I've got another 10 minutes because I just want to um, answer comments. <laughs> so that's the only thing. So don't mind me if you see me scratching, going crazy. <laughs> right? so then, um, yeah, so one of my other lecturers, uh, my entrepreneurship lecturer would always say, a great idea is useless because an idea, uh, and a great idea is useless because an idea is just an idea. It's about what that, what you do with that idea that makes all the difference. So it is better to have a crappy idea that is being implemented than, a, than an incredible genius idea that never gets implemented. So what most of us do is we have these brilliant genius ideas and then they become the best kept secret and they never ever get implemented. So they never ever make money for us. And then we see other people who have genius ideas. They go out there, they share, they have blah ideas, not even genius, like even subpar, less than average ideas. They go out there, they share them with the world. They invite other people who are brilliant to come on board, market the idea. The idea starts to make them money. They make a living from that. And then we're like, but my idea was more genius than that. Well, your idea was just an idea. The idea is just an idea. The most important thing is about what you, is what you do with that idea and how you implement it. And most times we cannot implement an idea on our own. I do not run wealthy money on my own. You know, I have to trust other people to do the work way better than I do. 
You know, like I don't do graphics. I suck at scheduling admin stuff. Even the blog posts, if it was left up to me, it would never get done, right? Like blog posts would never go up, all sorts of things. I'm great at writing the articles and then like someone else has to do the rest of the stuff, right? I'm, my thing is writing, live videos, coaching. I love all those things. But the other stuff is like, oh, you know, so we all need help to make those ideas a reality. And at some point, we're going to have to trust people to help us implement them, right? So if we are on this tip of invisibility or I only hire people from my clique, you know, I only hire people I grew up with or people that I click with, et cetera, et cetera, the ideas will probably die. You know, they probably won't grow the way they're supposed to. At some point, you're going to have to hire people that are great at what they do, even though they are strangers and you don't know them. So, wow, so many comments, you guys. I'm going to try and go through all of them. So, um, let's see. So, Donna, you say blood family are not always the, so the best source of re or resource. Definitely. In fact, I feel like sometimes it can be just drama, you know. And Olga, you say um, in Botswana, we were told that to be secretive outside, uh, to outsiders and some relatives about your gifts, etc. That's what they said. Yes. And then like nobody knows that you have those gifts. How is that helping you? You know, <laughs> like for people to hire you and pay you for your gifts, they need to know that the gift at least exists, that it is somewhere within the vicinity of your being, you know? And then Tom C, you say, uh, you say vow of loyalty to mediocrity. And you say, my, uh, my mom in love has that view too. Hide, hide, hide. Yes, true. And so Tom, uh, Tom C, you say true. Visibility equals uh, uh, profitability and that unconscious and the unconscious limiting beliefs. And you say yes to people and their self-absorbed drama true guys and you also say um oh yes generational wealth <laughs> and you say uh that the shrinking small part lord help me and showing your true greatness so tamsi you say v i'm over that right and you say <laughs> come on now so tamsi guys tamsi has been giving us a lot of great comments thanks tamsi and you say you um the vow of loyalty and you say i'm loving this and then you say um Oh, you were tagging someone to come onto the video. And then Portia, you say, oh, tell me about it. Loyalty to family. And Tamsi, you say, I'm also saying yes to your podcast, V. <laughs> yeah, like, Tamsi, have we ever asked you to come on board? Guys, we've asked, like, literally, I want you guys to know this. As Mizo says, for every, like, out of 10 black women that we ask for the podcast, or sometimes even 15, one will say yes. Only one. Out of 15 or 14 black men that we asked for the podcast, like literally 13 <laughs> or, four, or all 14 say yes. There is no dilly-dallying there. And I'm sure as Wadzi spoke about last week in her interview, which is episode 13 of the Money Magic series, there are many there are a lot of reasons for that in terms of the link between gender and visibility, which I'm not really uh, touching on here, right? But I just, I'm just making a point because it is really distressing to us. So that's why we talk, why I talk about it because it is just distressing. So Tamsi, you say the overgiving and people pleasing, yes. And Portia, you say boundaries. Um, and Paul, you say, I say yes to the podcast. And Donna, you say culture is very powerful. It is. So Tamsi, you say the healing. And uh, you also say, uh, so you say you respond to Mpo. Okay, guys. Wow, there are so many comments. Mpo, you say alignment, hey. And Donna, you're, you're saying um, 
know your audience yes like really know your target audience this i've always said that this is the same thing in relationships you know that some people date the wrong people and then they give the same kind of nonsense drama to those people to the wrong people and then they wonder why is this person just not taking it because they were not your target audience for the same old nonsense you know i've always said that from a young age i was like yeah just know your target market and know who your people are right because we all have different people so Tamsi you say heal the visibility issue and increasing um, my sales help me V and then you're saying implementations and implemented is powerful yes Lucia you say that's me my follow through is pathetic and um, Mahoto you say uh, done is better than perfect amen you know and Tamsi, you say delegating, trust ourselves. <laughs> and in Paul, you say um, trust people to help us implement ideas. And Lucia, you say this is a sermon. Here's what I will say. It's not just anyone that can help us implement ideas, right? But we need to be open to putting out adverts, to find people, to interview people, to go out to lunch, to have coffee with people, to network with people, to see who of those people will help us implement ideas. Uh, idea and then hire those people or else collaborate with them and donna you say my sister betrayed herself by not buying her house when she could because a significant other felt in inferior because she could uh, because she could do it without him amen do you see that level of invisibility my gosh donna my my like entire compassion and empathy goes towards your sister. Nothing hurts like that, you know? We're like literally, we allow ourselves not to go after something so important, like buying a house, having shelter for yourself and your kids. These are important things. And then you allow, and then like, but then we allow other people because we're loyal to them to help us stay small right to invisibilize ourselves because literally what the vow of invisibility is isn't is yeah it's a fear of being seen but actually it's like the vow to staying small the commitment to staying small right and so and like i said the vow of invisibility has so many different layers and touch points that add to it and keep it in place and this is just one of those things so margaret you say awesome chat as always once you've started working through your vow of invisibility how do you manage an environment that reinforces your invisibility in healing so then i would say if you are in that environment are you truly healing the vow of invisibility and i'll explain why i say that now right so you're saying that it reinforces your invisibility in a healthy way um you can exactly you can't exactly cancel family if they reinforce that invisibility i didn't cancel my mom margaret you guys just heard me tell the entire story. Never once did I say I argued with my mom. I swore at her. I canceled her. Hell no. I'm even going to check on her tomorrow when the guests show up. I'm going to call her, talk to her. Of course, like, I, you can't, you don't cancel people. But the thing is, her stuff is her stuff. What, what I, once we start to heal our traumas, we start to see when we are triggered, oh, I'm still triggered. So this vow is still there. I need to go deeper to heal it. So what I will say about vows is not something that you can affirm away. Like, oh, I am now feeling safe to be seen. No, a lot of it is like, like I said, this is so, this is something that is happening on a soul level. So it's often in the Akashic or on uh, the Akashic level and on a soul level that we have to be okay with releasing this vow. So often most people decide to just override the vow and they don't care about it. Who, and that's when even your health can become affected because your soul wants to honor the vow. It will do whatever it takes to try and get you to honor the vow, even if it means getting hurt, uh, getting an illness, anything just so that you can honor this vow, right? Or self-sabotaging on the deepest levels. Yeah. 
So then, uh, Donna, you say her credit is 850. Oh my gosh, her credit is incredible. She should just go ahead and get the uh, get the house, right? Tamsi, you say I'm loving this V, vow of invisibility, out, commitment of staying small. And Cindy, you say the mistake I do, I sell my properties when I'm broke. Ooh, Cindy, I'm sorry, hey? So, whew. Yeah, no, that's deep. That is deep. So, Cindy, what you need to be doing is uh, working more on um, creating a consistent stream of income, but also sorting out your spending habits or at least having a spending manifesto that is predictable and creating an emergency account over and above anything else, right? So maybe for you, an emergency account is key, right? And then you say, uh, Tansi, you say the triggers are great. Great, feed, uh, a great feedback. Yes, I agree. So wants to honor the vow. Yes, your soul always wants to honor the vow because it's almost like, guys, think of vows as like marital vows are the same thing. This is why breaking a marital vow can be some one of the most devastating things for a soul, you know, because it's a vow. And then worse, it's also, this one is consciously made on the spiritual plane. The vows that I've described are unconsciously made in the spiritual plane. Most of us even make the vow, the marital vow before God in the spiritual plane, right? And um, I don't know if you guys know this, but back in the day, one of the things, some, some, uh, some, relig some religious practices would say, even death cannot break this vow for marital vows. And so they got smart and they started saying um, this vow, they started doing the whole until death do us part and there is a re there's a reason why the vow has an addendum right because if marital vows were left open-ended then you are forever vowing to be connected to that soul across lifetimes because souls are eternal your soul is not going oh i've made this vow just for this lifetime sometimes we're unconsciously making vows across lifetimes. So now we're not just loyal. The vow of loyalty doesn't just come from this family in this lifetime. It's that we made vows of loyalty to family across different lifetimes, right? So now we have that added drama to deal with, right? Oh, vows of invisibility across lifetimes. That becomes fascinating. <laughs> well, I don't know. There's some money magic students who are having past life regressions right now with the with uh, the meditations. So it's, yeah, I don't think that they're finding it fascinating, but definitely scary for some of them, right? And um, Itlehen, you say, uh, I don't know. Sorry, I don't have my glasses. So if I mispronounce people's names and stuff, don't worry about me. This can't even begin to say how much the vow had kept me stagnant. I'm triggered, but I'm glad I'm learning. Yes. So Tamsi, you are saying, how do I break this vow of invisibility? Oh, the mosquitoes. <laughs> I've got the target audience, but the sales are okay, not great. And then, okay, so Tamsi, the vow of in Okay, so you've got a great audience, maybe. Okay, um, there are layers to this vow of invisibility. How much are you showing yourself? Are you sharing your products and services, etc.? So the way that we break the vows of invisibility is through the Money Magic course. So we do, there's many different meditations. And like I said, sometimes a vow of loyalty, a vow of invisibility actually stems from a vow of loyalty or from a deep, not good enough story. So it's not actually the vow of invisibility that just needs to be broken. It, it has to be broken in tandem or released or integrated, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> in tandem with all the other uh, uh, vows, right? And then Nantlantla, you say, oh my word, truly when the student is ready, the teachers appear. The whole week I've really been struggling with the feeling of uh, feeling enough and visibility. Oh wow! So glad this rec uh, this resonated with you, Nantlantla. And then Nantiantiavo, you say hi, Van. Sorry, I'm late. It's okay. You can watch the replay. And then Tamsi, you say Money Magic Course. I'm enrolling. Okay, so guys, let me tell you a little about the Money Magic Course, which is currently closed for registration. But you guys can go on the wait. You can sign up on the waiting list. And if you feel like 
this is a dire emergency. I've triggered you beyond any words, which sometimes happens. Sends me an inbox, send me an inbox, and then I will tell you how you can enroll before time. But if you know that you can wait, then please do so. Um, if you are like triggered and yeah, so get on the waiting list, right? So go to wealthy-money.com forward slash money magic. Again, wealthy-money.com forward slash money magic. I will put the link in the description of this video. This is where we do a lot of the healing work on these things that I've discussed. So on your vows of loyalty, not good enough, on the vows of invisibility, on increasing your income, putting to doing the income challenge, doing the practical stuff, calculations, etc. So check that out. Get on the waiting list. Of course, keep leaving comments below. Send me inboxes. Um, yeah, I look. I'll open up the Money Magic course at the end of October for registration. So definitely get on the waiting list and check it out. So thank you so much, guys. So um, Tamsi, the link is wealthy-money.com forward slash money magic. And you say this is a need. And Paul, you say it is an emergency, sister. So Paul, send, uh, send me an email, right? Um, send me an inbox via Facebook. Um, and let's have a conversation, right? So if you have any questions, feel. <laughs> Donna, you say I've been trying to enroll. My bad. Donna, it's closed for registration. So right now you get on the waiting list. Send me an inbox, right? If you want to enroll. Um, I know you've been told a lot about the course by one of the Money Magic students, right? So uh, you already know all about it because she's been telling you about it. So Nantianja, but you say, um, please enroll. This is where healing is. Yes. So Donna, you say, love your work, queen. Your voice is soothing. Oh, thank you, guys. Thank you so much for showing up on a Saturday and allowing me to talk about this <laughs> and sharing my <laughs> mother wound, my family drama. Although in this case, yesterday, I had to finally admit, I think I started to understand that I, wow, I'm triggering my mother because I know the family vow of loyalty. And it's taken me this long to understand that some things that I do are absolutely triggering to her because it goes against the things that we've been taught. And Shay, my mother does live in deep fear of people harming me by seeing the gifts and the work that I do, right? So it's okay though. Everything is all good. So Paul, you say thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you for showing up. Have a fantastic evening. Oh, evening my time, afternoon your time. So have a fantastic afternoon or morning further. Cheers. <laughs>